Well, we definitely have our own set of challenges um, with running TPA very few times during the year. Um, we're expected to be proficient at a skill that we really don't get a lot of hands-on experience with, so it's a unique challenge of its own. Um, but there's also some benefits to um, the proximity of our CT scanner to our ER department is of help. And as well as I think that small team, that, you know, that family kind of, um, that, uh, just that sense of family that we have and that teamwork that we have that we're able to create because we are a small tight-knit group. So there are many differences between the rural sites as opposed to the urban sites. Although we try to give the same stroke care, um, we have our certain set of challenges that they don't face in the urban sites. And the main one being that we don't have a large stroke volume. For example, in our site, we've only given TPA six times in the last year. So we're expected to be proficient at a skill that we really don't get a lot of hands-on practice. So it's uh, certainly a challenge that we're working with at our site. Um, there also is some benefits uh, in a small site. We have a real tight sense of team. We're a family. We work together really well. And communication is a little bit easier because there's less people to communicate things to. I think that's a benefit. Um, another benefit that we also have is the close proximity of our CT scanner to our e depart ER department. It's, it's essentially right there, so that saves a lot of time. At our site, we have a lot of high-tech physical resources. Um, we have the capability of doing a CT scans and CT angiograms. We have telehealth equipment where we can connect live with, our stroke, with a stroke neurologist from the city. So it's almost as if they're there. So it's really amazing technology. Um, and, and that's a physical, from a physical point of view. We, the, we also have the benefit of having support people. So even though we don't have stroke neurologists right on site, they're easily accessible. They're very approachable for consult, and that's a real gift. We also have a North Zone stroke lead who acts as a li liaison between us and the city if we have any issues or you know, any communication issues that need to be resolved. Over the past few years, we've really worked to refine our stroke process. Um, we, we have lots of strategies in place so that you know, pay, our nurses know what to do and the process is very well defined from start to finish. Um, having, first of all, it starts with the EMS, having them know which facility to go to, to bypass to a primary stroke uh, facility. And that's hugely important. And you know, as far as letting them know what their role is, starting IVs, pre-notification, all those sorts of things. So we've got all those things in place. Um, most of our crews are trained to, to take the patient straight to CT scan. And um, at our facility, I've even, kind of warn the physicians that they may or may not even get to see the patient before the patient goes to CT. So we've got a really streamlined process in place. Most recently at our facility, um, to reduce our door to needle times, we've created some checklists and in the form of evaluation forms and, and just guidelines for our nurses and our unit clerks to reference. Because we don't deal with high volume strokes, it's not something that we do every day. Um, you know, it's nice to have that checklist just to make sure that we've gotten everything done. Um, and lots of memos circulate all the time when we get an idea about little things that we can do to save minutes here and there. Um, for example, something as simple as having our DI staff not helping with patient transfers on and off the stretchers. Um, you know, we just circulate a memo and, and those little strategies all, all add up to minutes which, you know, add, add up to better patient outcomes. We've put many strategies into place to reduce our door to needle times. I think one of the most effective ones that we've had is calling for extra nursing staff. Um, we have a code assignment where if there is a code blue called overhead that, you know, so-and-so is assigned to meds and so-and-so is assigned to airway. And we've now added stroke to that. So having an extra set of hands to swarm that patient so that we can do everything in unison as soon as the patient gets there, you know, they're being attacked by DI, by the physician, by two sets of nursing hands to get everything done as efficiently as possible instead of doing things in a parallel sequence. Um, so that's been, a, that's been a really efficient strategy for us, um, as well as the checklists. Um, the, other biggest, the other big thing that has really improved our door-to-needle times is clarifying who is going to 
communicate with Rapid and how that's going to happen after the CT scan. We've always given them heads up, the pre-notification, but um, now it's clarified that once our doc has seen the patient, they are the ones who are going to be calling Rapid. Often we were waiting for Rapid to call us back, Rapid was waiting for us to call them. There was a mass confusion that resulted in, in length, of, in time wasted. Uh, again, the, the biggest barrier to achieving um, consistent low door to needle times would be the proficiency. So an, another thing that we're hoping to do in the near future is to do lots of mock stroke codes. Um, so we'll set up an in, you know, a pretend inpatient and, and um, call, the, you know, call the team in to deal with this stroke. Um, one thing that we're, I want to be very careful to do is to do that during times when the nursing staff isn't really busy. I really want it to be something that enhances the nurse's comfort level and you know, their ability to care for the patient. I don't want it to cause extra stress for the nurses, but to actually relieve stress. So finding some quiet, quieter times to do these mock stroke codes is a, a bit of a challenge, but it's just something that we you know, keep in the back of our mind every day. Would this be a good day? And I think in that way, we should be able to achieve door to needle times. Um, the other most important thing that we do is really creating a sense of team and a good sense of enthusiasm. You know, why we do what we do. It's all about the patients. So when we have a good patient outcome, we celebrate it. We celebrate it big. We celebrate it with cake. We celebrate it with bulletin boards. We, <laughs> we celebrate. And, um, you know, that really creates a sense of team and it just keeps that positive momentum moving forward. Endovascular treatment is, is kind of a new technology and not all of our nurses and physicians are even aware of it. So that's been the first um, thing that needs to be attacked, I guess, if you will, is letting people know that this treatment is available and that it works. So that's what we've been kind of focused on over the last few months. Now on a practical level, uh, what, needs, what we need to shift is that mentality that, oh, the patient's outside the TPA window we can relax. <laughs> That's not the case anymore. Even if the patient is outside of the TPA window, they might still be a candidate for endovascular. So it's just reminding people that this therapy is available and we still need to be efficient and on the ball, um, even if they're not, doesn't look like they're gonna be TPA candidates. The number one tip that I would give to other small sites is to remember that we're a team and really embrace that team. Most of our, our primary sites are blessed to have a stroke navigator or a stroke coordinator of some sort, but a captain is nothing without a crew that is efficient and knows what they're doing and is passionate about what they do. So really enhancing that sense of team, I think is the most important thing that, that we can do as stroke coordinators in our rural sites, as well as education, because people are more willing to comply if they know why. So in Westlock, we had a very amazing success story very recently. We were able to achieve a door to needle time of 30 minutes. Now, I'm, I'm really proud of this because I really thought it was impossible. Um, you know, you guys talked about it. We're going to give it a try. You know, the quicker's pushing it but I really didn't think it was possible. We had a very competent crew to begin with, a very knowledgeable, passionate, dedicated crew. And even then our door to needle time average was 69 minutes over the last year. So to get that even more than cut in half, I thought was you know, gonna be impossible. But um, all the stars aligned for us one day and we were able to achieve this Im impossible feat. Of, of 30 minutes and it took every single member knowing their role and performing it efficiently and effectively. Um, you know, it, at any point in time, the process could have been delayed if one person didn't do what they needed to do and that we had each other's backs too. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't that we each had our own role. It was constant communication. So um, it was just a, a really huge, huge blessing to be part of not only achieving the goal, but seeing the results of the goal. And I think that's really what it's all about. When you see that patient go from having a completely debilitating stroke where you can't understand a word they're saying, they can't use their one side of their body, to making a full recovery and smiling at you. And you know, you, you see their smile and you tell them how beautiful it is. And they tell us that, you know, she told, she looked me in the eyes and said, I'll never stop smiling. I've got my smile back and I'll never stop smiling. 
I mean, those are the moments that we live for. That is why we do what we do. So that was um, the most amazing success story of all time at our facility, as far as I'm concerned.